Ladies and gentlemen, it is my particular pleasure to welcome you to our today's lay lecture of the Aeronet Neuron. We have a particularly interesting and attractive topic today. It is neuroethics. And those of you who kind of follow the development and the advancement in the neuroscience research, you will know that we have a lot of questions arising in this regard and that the ethics of neuro, neuro, neurology and neuroscience research has become an extremely important issue and is societal, very societally very, very important. Therefore, uh, I think we will have a very interesting um, presentation today. But before we go to this presentation, I would like to present to you myself. My name is Mali Stoalesta. I coordinate the Aeronet Neuron and uh, in the frame of which we organize these uh, lay lectures. And I would like to tell you something about an Aeronet because it's of course not uh, so popular that you know immediately what it is and why we do all this. I have a few slides for you that I would like to present. Again, my name is Malis Dorlecht. I coordinate this, uh, this ERANET on behalf of the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research. And first, a few housekeeping rules. This lecture will be recorded and published on it so that you could see and, you and uh, your friends and other people could see the videos from the speakers. And uh, this means only the videos from uh, from us, from the speakers, from Etienne Hirsch and Ravi Schneeweiss will be visible during the whole webinar, uh, but you cannot switch on your camera. We will have a question and answers session at the end. So we hope for a lot of questions, a lot of interest from you. Please type them in the chat and we shall read them out and uh, our speaker will answer them for you. Now, what is an Aeronet? Aeronet Neuron is a network of European funding for neuroscience research. You can see here a map and flags of many countries who over the past 20 years have entered the Aeronet Neuron. And we are now more than 30 countries who work together with the European Commission to fund brain research that is related to brain diseases. We want to promote translational research into the brain and its diseases, which means that we want to combine basic researchers with clinical researchers. We would like to bring them together and support their research in groups of different disciplines and different areas. We fund uh, research consortia in the areas of neurology and psychiatry, like head trauma and spinal cord trauma, pain, stroke, epilepsy, all these are topics that we have covered. And on the psychiatric end, depression, autism, schizophrenia, and others. We also have cross-section topics like sensory disorders or neuroinflammation, new methods and technology developments, biomarkers, and neuroethics. What do we offer? There are several programs that we offer as a service, and one of the most important are, of course, the joint funding activities and the budgets that we jointly spend on research. In total, we have already spent around 200 million euros. We were able to fund more than 200 transnational research consortia, and in these research consortia, research groups from all our member countries are working together and it's already or around 100 1000 research groups we also lobby at national and international and european levels to promote research into brain health to help all the patients who are affected with these diseases we interconnect researchers and other stakeholders across europe and beyond we have an entire program of support of young neuroscientists because they are the future of this research area. We have an excellent paper award. We have privileged access to high class training. We have workshops, poster sessions, and much more. And we want to interact with society. We don't want to leave our 
uh, knowledge in our drawers. We engage patients on every level of our decisions. We have YouTube educational video clips that we produced. We interact by our social media and we organize these lay lectures. And without further delay, I would like to wish to you that you enjoy this lecture. And I would like to pass the floor to Etienne Hirsch, who is the director of the National French National Institutes of Health in SAM. Please, Etienne. Thank you, Marlies. Yes, I'm uh, working uh, at INSAM and I'm the director for the Institute for Neuroscience, uh, Neurology and Psychiatry. And it is my great pleasure to uh, uh, organize with my colleague this uh, lay lecture and especially to introduce uh, the speaker of uh, tonight. Uh, his name is uh, Hervé Schneeweiss and uh, Hervé is a uh, medical doctor, a PhD, and a very well-known scientist. He was first trained as a neurologist. He worked in the field of movement disorders, especially Parkinson's disease, and he's employed by CNRS, which is an agency covering all research in, in France. He was involved in the neurogenetics of human diseases, such as uh, cerebellar ataxia, uh, among many others. And for the last 15 years, his scientific work was dedicated to the biology of uh, astrocytes. Uh, as you know, astrocytes are uh, other cells in the brain. They are in the vicinity of the, the neuron, and they are almost as numerous as the, the neurons. Uh, his work was uh, mostly dedicated to brain tumor progression, and he created in 2006 the INSEAM laboratory uh, INSEAM U752, which uh, gathered scientists and clinicians devoted to the study of brain tumors. Hervé is since 2014 the director of the Laboratory Neurosciences Parisienne at Sorbonne University in Paris. <clears throat> but Hervé has other talent. Hervé is also involved in bioethics and he's uh, 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 extremely well known also in this field and he's the president of INSERM Ethic Committee. He was also appointed member of the National Consultative Ethic Committee for France, and he writes a, a bioethic column in the journal uh, Medicine Science, of, we, of which he was the editor in chief for two, from 2006 to 2016. Recently, he has been strongly involved in the OECD recommendation on responsible innovation in neuroethics. And uh, <clears throat> the topic of his, call to the, of his talk today will be neuroethics. I would like just to remind you that uh, during the call, you can use the Q&A function to ask your question. And Marlies and I will read your question uh, at the end of his presentation. So uh, Hervé, once again, thank you for uh, accepting uh, our invitation and the floor is now yours. Thank you, Etienne, and uh, without uh, any delay, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, and uh, use a few slides. Okay, uh, so uh, since uh, Etienne already uh, said so many kind words, I'm going to skip uh, this uh, uh, slide, but it's clear that uh, I have links of interest with the topic that is going to be developed. Uh, and we are going to start with uh, some basic definition because uh, noethics is a part of bioethics. Bioethics uh, deals with what link biological science to ethical concern. For example, you all know that uh, before any kind of clinical research, we need to obtain the informed consent of the patient because this is a way to respect autonomy, dignity, 
regarding the participation of this individual in research. In neuroscience, uh, uh, neuroethics concerns the ethical, legal, and social implications of neuroscience. And this can be seen from the practice of neuroscience. For example, uh, if you ask people to participate in some cerebral brain imaging study, what about any kind of incidental findings you can uh, find in someone without any symptom, uh, a tumor or some uh, vascular dysplasia? So what kind of uh, decision you have to take, what kind of process you have to develop? Uh, and the other side is uh, the impact on the society of the various discoveries uh, that neuroscience is uh, making. And this is the main aspect of neuroethics. Uh, we are not going to deal with the specific field of neuroscience of moral philosophy, how our brain is processing uh, our moral behavior. This is another field. This should be the neuroscience of ethics. We are going with the ethics of neuroscience. So we need to start with very dark ages. Uh, we need to remember that at the beginning of the 20th century, we had a movement named eugenics. This movement was in Europe. This movement was in North America. This movement considered that systematic sterilization or euthanasia were acceptable practice to purify the rice. And this started with hundreds, thousands of mentally retarded or mentally ill people sterilized in Europe before the Second World War. And this peak with the final solution of Nazis with Jews and gypsies. We need also to remember the dark age of neuroscience, the beginning of brain imaging. Uh, it's well remember Walter Dundee, uh, developing ventriculography or pneumoencephalography using hair as a contrast agent to see the brain. And it was so painful and so dangerous with several people dying that Harvey Cushing, another great neuroscientist of the time, uh, called for stop and opposed uh, Dandy's practice. We need also to remember scientists such as Egas Moniz, uh, one other pioneer of brain imaging uh, that was using with subject uh, contrast agent, uh, killing some with cerebral thrombosis, killing some other with the secondary risk of these contrast agents with cirrhosis of the liver, leukemia, hemangioedema. And the same guy, and this, this guy, I guess, when he's received the Nobel Prize for that, was the developer of psychosurgery and particularly the well-known lobotomy. Some of you have seen the movie uh, Fly Over a Cuckoo's Nest. And uh, we had misuse and abuse of psychosurgery in the treatment of mentally ill patients uh, for many decades until the 60s. And you need to remember that for many countries, including some European countries, uh, homosexuality, for example, was considered as a mental disorder for a very long period. So um, in parallel with the development of bioethics after the Nuremberg trials, after the Helsinki uh, declaration, after the Belmont report, in neuroscience too, the idea of a dialogue with a society uh, raised with the development of international organizations such as IBRO, with the development of the uh, Society for Neuroscience, developing some lectures, and the first report dealing with uh, ethical aspect of neuroscience was produced at UNESCO by the International Bioethic Council in 1996, uh, uh, and then uh, a conference in uh, 2002, Neuroethics Mapping the Field, was the launch for the development, the real development of the field, specific lecture as SFN, the creation of an international society named International uh, Society for Neuroethics. 
So to, to, to be a little bit more concrete, I'm going to take the five main questions that neuroscientists now uh, need to ask themselves when they de they've developed their practice. And this was raised in the framework of the International Brain Initiative. You know, this initiative uh, is gathering the major brain initiatives taken in several countries, including Europe with the Human Brain Project and now uh, the successor of the Human Brain Project, the eBrain Project. So the first question is, what is the potential impact of a model uh, on individual and societies. Just take as an example the fact that now with brain imaging or with some genetic test, we can know the process that is going to lead to Alzheimer's disease 20 years, 25 years before any kind of symptoms. And you have to remember that some very famous people, the, one president of the United States, one president of France developed such a disease. What about knowing uh, the process before any kind of symptom? Is there any possibility or unintended consequences? But you see what kind of dilemmas are appearing. What does the absence of early diagnosis mean for the primacy of personal autonomy? You need to know you are you have the process before being um, affected, before developing dementia. Does the absence of a curative treatment for Alzheimer's disease negate any kind of early intervention? No, we know that a high level of education, uh, practice of sport, we know that prevention of comorbidity slow the pace of the disease or delay the appearance of the symptoms. So it's important to make the diagnosis early and to let the patient know. But as soon as you are making the diagnosis, what about the patient that is going to know what is going to happen to her or him? What about his or her family? What about the workplace? How to prevent discrimination uh, because of the prejudice uh, or because of the development of some uh, aspect of dementia. So you see, these tensions are the real heat of the kind of, uh, of, of dilemmas that neuroethics is going to deal with, and also a more philosophical challenge, which is the utilitarian view already developed five centuries ago by John Locke, that we will not fundamentally change in the future. You consider that you can take decisions for yourself now because you will be more or less the same in 10 years from now. But when you are going to begin demented, what are you going to be in 10 years from now? Second question is more technical. It's about the standards, uh, about the biological material or the data that are collected. Is it the same anywhere in the world, how neuroscientists can collaborate one with the other? And for example, in Europe, we are highly protected with uh, GPDR, with uh, uh, op cool opinions with, on privacy and data collection. But what about sharing this data with others, uh, which is very important for research? What is the due respect for persons? Uh, due respect to their autonomy, but also to the impact of making studies with their data. Third question is the moral significance of some neural systems that we are developing in our labs. A very common tool now that we are going many labs are organoids. Organoids are 3D self-organized structures that mimic part of the brain and mimic part of some function. Uh, of some circuits of the brain. And we can do now more and more complex organoids to try to see the connections of part of the cortical uh, brain with deeper part or with the uh, spinal cord. Very important to progress in the knowledge of neuroscience. But on the ethical part, some begin to wonder could this organoid at a given time feel some kind of pain? Could this complex organoid at a given time could raise some kind of consciousness? 
And in both cases, could it be possible to measure the pain of an organoid? Could it be measure the raise of a consciousness with it, an organoid? So we have to raise these kind of questions when developing the technique. The first question is uh, how our intervention and particle in health uh, that we hope will impact for the benefit of the patient, how they could also in some ways reduce autonomy. And we will later get back to this with the discussion on neurotechnology. And finally, uh, what it means about our neurotechnologies, our innovation, uh, when they are in real use. Obviously, we are thinking uh, about um, uh, health and disease, but we already know that some of our applications are now in use uh, in the military or are now used in education for the best or for the worst. We are going to discuss this point or could be used by some companies that are more interested in uh, collecting brain data and uh, proposing some services to you, for example, a brain to text technologies that we are going to uh, discuss more now. So you see that our uh, advance in science are now raising a lot of new questions on how neuroscience and how the new knowledge in neuroscience is going to impact uh, our cognitive functions, but also impact the way we behave as uh, normal lay citizens. And to illustrate more of these points, I am going to take the example of neurotechnology and the various uh, texts, the various questions that are under development uh, to uh, develop this neurotechnology, but also to protect uh, our brains. So we start first with a definition, what are neurotechnology? Uh, in an expert group, and uh, Etienne already mentioned, I was part of this expert group, we decide uh, this definition that is now uh, in the OECD report of 2019. But neurotechnology are devices and procedures used to access, monitor, study, evaluate, manipulate, and or mimic the structure and function of the neural system of individuals. To say it another way, any kind of device or procedure that will allow to read your brain, to read the activity of your brain, or any kind of device and procedures that are going to write your brain to change the activity of your brain. And it's clear that we have many devices now that are uh, allowing these uh, well-known non-invasive devices uh, that are the EEG, electroencephalography helmets. Uh, and you can find some of these devices very cheap uh, in uh, uh, some kind of uh, shops. Or at that time, invasive devices that are used in the field of health. And just to let you know about the incredible advance of this technology nowadays, uh, this summer were reported new invasive technology, electrodes that need to be uh, placed inside the brain, but that were able to, uh, to, to allow people to recover speech even 10 years after losing any possibility to speak, and speech at a speed that is two thirds than the usual speed of a normal speech with a vocabulary of several hundred of thousand words in one case. So, and, and with the possibility to modulate uh, the, the, the vocalization. So incredible advances in brain computer interfaces and in the way we can decode some brain activity. So uh, on one hand, this is wonderful because you know that uh, neurological and psychiatric disease account for one third of our health expenditure, which means something like 900 
thousand no nine hundred millions um, mil, billions uh, nine hundred millions of euros every year in Europe, more than two trillions of dollars each year in the United States. And it's not only money, it's also the considerable suffering. We already mentioned uh, Alzheimer's disease, but uh, you know about Parkinson, uh, uh, multiple sclerosis is the first cause of handicap in young people. 13% of the world population suffers from migraines. Uh, and in the field of uh, mental disorders, uh, between 1.5 and 2% of the kids have some uh, trouble of the autistic spectrum disorder, and so on and so forth. So neurotechnology could be part of the solution. I just presented the uh, brain-to-speech uh, um, device. We have also now uh, possibilities um, under development uh, of uh, helping people that lost their uh, capacity to walk, paraplegia, to recover some kind of walk. But on the other side, you have some other use that are going to challenge our identity, our physical and mental integrity, and our autonomy. For example, what should mean a soldier that you equipped with a system that would allow him to uh, activate some ammunition, some arms, more quickly than his or her autonomous thought. What it could mean to have a brain to text uh, system oh. without the keyboard that could allow you to text uh, from your computer or your smartphone directly from your thinking, but your thinking being collected by companies uh, oh. like uh, uh, Neuralink, uh, Facebook, Google, name it uh, the way you want. And this is the reason uh, that uh, uh, international organization, OECD uh, from 2015 to 2019, uh, decided to go for some recommendation. And UNESCO with International Brain um, Council uh, made also a report in uh, 2021 on ethical issues. So I will not have time to enter into the details of these two uh, reports, and I strongly recommend it that you go on the OECD website or on the UNESCO website and read these documents. But I am going to uh, describe rapidly what they are and the ethical implications. For the OECD recommendation, you have nine principles, and these are just the headlines because Within each of these principles, you have several sub-principles. What are they? First, we need to promote a responsible innovation, uh, which means something that works, something that is truthful, something that is really addressing a real health challenge. Obviously, this needs to be safe and easy to use. We need to promote inclusivity from an ethical point of view, what would mean to have the technology and not giving the technology to people that need the technology. This is a question of access. We need to foster collaboration to promote the development of this technology. We need to enable societal deliberation, and this is what we are trying to do with this seminar today. We need to enable the capacity of oversight and advisory bodies. It's absolutely needed to regulate this field, not only in the health sector where it's already highly regulated, but also in the other application. We have uh, described some application in the field of education. Uh, it could be wonderful if some device could help children with some disabilities, dyscalculia, dyslexia, to uh, learn more easily. Uh, it would be wonderful to uh, help uh, in other fields, uh, like, for example, uh, security. Um, some other aspects we will come back later are more uh, discussable. We need to safeguard the personal data. It's absolutely needed to protect the privacy. 
we need to promote a culture of stewardship and trust between the public and private sectors. This is the question of how the uh, researchers of the public sector, uh, like the, the people, may, many of the people that are gathered tonight, uh, and the private sector that are developing products and that is searching for some benefits are going to work together. And finally, but not the last, but not the least, we absolutely need to anticipate and monitor the potential unintended use or misuse of this neural technology. And we know that each new technology uh, we discover with the use of the technology some unintended use and in certain case that it's misuse. So you could say uh, these are general principles, uh, how to use them, how to make them uh, concrete. This is what we have done uh, with the, the help of the French Minister for um, Higher uh, Education and Research, with the help of uh, the Institute of Neuroscience that uh, Etienne is uh, heading. Uh, we developed this charter with some five main field. The first one is to protect personal brain data, because as said, these devices are going to collect this data. We need the people and patients, whether they are patients or users, to have a clear, accessible, and rigorous information about how the data are collected, how they are processed, how they are used, where and how they are stored, what kind of dissemination? Is there any idea of sharing such data? Is there any idea of reuse or possibility of identification? And you should know that when you are doing nothing, you are, uh, your brain is not doing nothing. Your brain is working all the time, night and day, seven days out, all your uh, life. And the activity of your brain is not that different in at least uh, energy consumption, whether you are awake or sleeping. That means that when you are doing nothing, your brain is using a, a, a system that we know names a default mode. And you should know that the default mode is the same way able to identify you as the fingerprinting. If we know your default mode, we know that the recording is com coming from you. So the possibility to re-identify and to use for malicious use as a possibility. So we absolutely need to protect and have a clear uh, knowledge of the how the, the, the data are processed. Obviously, the right to refuse sharing, obviously the right to delay your information. The second point of this charter is to ensure reliability, safety, and security, whether it is in the health, already highly regulated, or non-medical device. And this is done to be sure that you are really protected, that the devices are really effective, that we have some kind of reversibility, and we know that, for example, some implants that were used to allow some people with blindness to recover some sight. The company uh, went to bankruptcy and 300 patients stayed with their implant. No more battery, no more uh, see again, sight again, and it's terrible for these people. So we need to ensure reversibility and we need to think uh, to have feedbacks from patients and users. Number three, uh, we need uh, ethical communication, no hype, no unrealistic expectation. You are going to sleep so well with this device. You are going to be cool with this device, no more stress. No, that's just impossible. And conversely, no uh, unfunded fear. This device is going to read your mind and transform you into a cyborg. So, not one side, not the other side, the real, the real thing. We need for that scientific evidence and 
many of the devices that you can find in the market now. <laughs> for, for example, these small boxes of nine volts that are sending to you some uh, currents, uh, there is absolutely no scientific evidence that they are doing anything on your brain. And finally, we need transparency about the use of algorithm because most of these devices are with uh, a lot of um, algorithm and AI inside. As already said, we need to prevent misuse, uh, uh, such as intrusive surveillance. Uh, we have seen this, uh, uh, slide, this photo that I showed earlier of these kids uh, Chinese kids with their helmet on the head. Uh, it was just an experiment, but to make it more fun, it was to monitor if they were awake, in, awake and, and listening to the teacher. And to make the experiments more fun, uh, the parents had a report on their smartphone to see uh, the diagram of the activity, the brain activity of their kids along the day. Uh, you can uh, see what kind of discussion at night uh, could occur with such diagrams. Uh, and obviously, we need to anticipate and block activities that are intended to influence the decision making process, the use of such device to bias your decision, for example, with marketing or with some buyings. And finally, we have to take account of societal expectation what kind of real needs, what kind of inclusiveness, what kind of dialogue, what kind of access, what kind of participation. And this webinar, once again, uh, is an example of the discussion and the conversation we can have. All of that to prevent discrimination and to have the best communication possible. This is already a whole slide because uh, in this uh, map, you have uh, something like 30, uh, a little bit more than 20 organizations that sign, private organization, public organization, a patient's organization, uh, agencies. The important thing is that when you have signed such charter, you are engaged to do it, and particularly for the private sector too. And now we have a dialogue at the European level with the European Brain Council, with the Federation of Neuroscience Society, with Aranet Neuron, uh, and many others to make it a uh, European uh, charter on neurotechnology and have the various actors engage in the same process. To go quickly with uh, IBC, I have really no time to enter into the details, but once again, the text is available on the website of uh, IBC at uh, UNESCO. Uh, the main ethical issues of neurotechnology are the mental integrity and human dignity. If you have uh, some device that are able to challenge your mental integrity, what means human dignity? How we are going to preserve our personal identity and not become cyborgs? How we are going to preserve our freedom of thought, our cognitive liberty and not being biased? by this device? What about surveillance? What about the possibility to keep our mental privacy, not having our data collected and analyze what kind of brain data confidentiality we should be sure of keeping? On another aspect, distributive justice, access of people that need such kind of device to access to this device how to prevent discrimination and bias, how to prevent misuse, what means augmentation, what kind of brain augmentation we can expect, what kind of enhancement. Obviously, all of us would like to have a better memory uh, and we'd uh, like to have a, a smart thinking, but is it possible from the scientific point of view? And if it's possible, is it possible that we create a kind of enhanced people that are going to dominate a kind of plain lay people. Finally, two main points. Uh, the, the interest of the child. The interest of the child is of major importance because the brain of a child is not a small adult brain. The brain of a child is a brain in 
under development. What kind of impact could have uh, this neurotechnology? The same questions that are also already raised today for screens, the exposure of child to screen. Uh, the same question of exposure of child to some kind of EI. What is the impact on brain development? What is the impact of uh, on the brain of adolescent? And we know that the brain of adolescent is in complete reorganization and reshaping. Uh, and once again, uh, we absolutely need to raise scientific evidence in the field and to think about the impact. And finally, is there still an informed consent in this uh, field of uh, technology? Uh, this is a, a question to raise. So all these raised at various levels. Uh, it's uh, uh, IBC, but also uh, in other uh, arenas of uh, the neuroscientific uh, community, the question of neuro rights. What it means? It means that uh, maybe because of this specific challenge to our mental integrity, to our mental privacy, to our freedom of soul, to our free will, maybe we should need some new human rights and some kind of amendment to the human uh, right uh, declaration. At the IBC, we consider that uh, these rights are already enshrined, protected in the existing human rights. Uh, we need to be sure that what is written in physical integrity enshrines also mental integrity, but it's already in the fundamental basic text. Uh, the uh, UN Charter or the um, uh, European Charter. Mental privacy and freedom of thought, the same. They are already fundamental rights that exist. So we consider neural rights uh, as um, sensitive rights that should be gathered, uh, like, for example, reproductive rights are gathered. And why not naming that neural right? But instead of creating new rights, already applying the existing human rights and uh, moving at the various level, national, international, uh, to uh, check for the instrument and the documents and be sure that uh, the elements such as mental integrity uh, are correctly protected. Uh, and finally, we are now moving, as said, with fans uh, through the European Charter. Just a week ago, uh, the uh, UNESCO uh, annual, uh, biannual uh, general assembly uh, decided to uh, develop a recommendation on neurotechnology. Uh, two years ago, uh, recommendation on EI was de already developed. So now uh, twin recommendation will be developed on neurotechnology. In the European project, uh, eBrain's uh, Science and Society Committee will dig with these kind of questions. Uh, Malis is uh, trying to develop now uh, another big European project named CSA Health. And I'm quite sure that in this framework, uh, this kind of ethical challenge will be also discussed, but this is nothing if it's only experts that are dealing with this question. We ob obviously need experts, but it's not enough because it's uh, really a question of society. It's really a question of what kind of human we want to be tomorrow, what kind of human, human we want our uh, child, grandchild, future generation to be. These need your implication, and I am uh, really uh, keen to uh, the organizer of this uh, webinar uh, for the invitation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Hervé, for this uh, very uh, enlightening uh, uh, presentation. Uh, as you said, as a citizen, we should all be involved in uh, neuroethics. Uh, uh, before starting the discussion, I would like to remind the audience uh, that uh, you can use the Q&A 
uh, 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 button to uh, ask your question and Marlies and myself uh, will uh, read your questions. Maybe um, I, I, I can uh, ask uh, a, a, a first question. As a scientist, and especially when research is funded by the, the, the government, by public money, we, we are requested to work with open science. So in other words, we are supposed to share all the data, to make all the data accessible to, uh, to, to everybody. Is that not in contradistinction with uh, uh, neuroethics where uh, you, you need the, the, the privacy? And uh, uh, it's not just a, a, a general uh, question, because as you said, if you take the uh, recording of the, uh, uh, the, 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 how our brain is working during sleep, you are able to recognize the, the person. So pseudo-anonymization is quite difficult. So really, how do you see open science and uh, neuroethics and uh, personal data? Thank you for the, for the question, Etienne, because it's, uh, it's clear that uh, it's, a, uh, it's a, a complex question. It's not a simple question. I'm going to give some simple answers, but it's not a simple question. Uh, because you have to distinguish be between the data by itself, uh, and the data by itself is not something so important. This, the important thing is the use of the data. And uh, the people that are uh, giving their data, the people that allow some collection of the data, uh, they should know first that there is a collection of the data uh, because very often it's unknown. For example, all these devices that uh, are going to be used to relax or to increase your quality of sleep, things that are not scientifically demonstrated once again. Uh, if they want to use the device, they are going to click uh, a button and say, okay, your information or some recording of your activity will be collected. If you are not clicking the device, you are not going to, clicking the, the consent, you are not going to, to uh, use the device. So first, you absolutely need to know. And this is what GPDR is trying to do. Uh, we need to improve GPDR because for example, for uh, brain data, there is no indication of the delay uh, where you need anonymization or pseudonymization. And it's known, it's clear that for neuroscience, uh, if you are waiting for one hour before anonymization, uh, you can use the data for this one hour. And the important thing is to monitor the brain activity in the next milliseconds, not in the next hour. So we need to, to go into the details, the technical details, of what kind of, what is a brain data and what kind of brain data and how we collect the brain data and how we store them, how we analyze them. And, now, and then get back your question and the ethical concern, how we use this data. And many of uh, the people that are in this audience uh, or uh, of our patients or of, our, uh, of the lay public will be very happy with helping fundamental research, with helping academic researcher and participating in open science. If they are informed, if they can follow the use, if they can have some feedback about the result. But many of them will be very reluctant or suspicious with some commercial use of the same kind of data and will ask the researchers or the databases to protect their data from some kind of use they don't want or even some kind of malignant or misuse or malignant use 
to try to trace some kind of the of thoughts, to try to to trace some of their habits, to use uh, this data as a way of surveillance or the, as a way of discriminations to change their uh, premium uh, for the insurance and things like that. So you see, we need to to get some distance from the, we we need to to dig into the technical aspect of the data, but even more on how we trace the use of the data and how we uh, help the easy use in authorized field and prevention in other field. So you have plenty of, uh, of uh, open possibilities. For example, some people are thinking about blockchain to try to label, to try to label uh, the informations, to try to make them blocks, to label the information and to, to be able to trace where, when and how the information was used. So I think that it's compatible to have open science and the development of open science and ethical science with the uh, development and protection of uh, uh, and prevention of uh, non-authorized uh, use. Maybe I could uh, ask the next question, Etienne, if this is okay with you. Yes, uh, absolutely. Harry, that was very, very interesting. And I have to admit, I, I, I am a bit nervous now <laughs> about everything that can happen. With the, when you know you know when you read the journals and the exciting science and this is described and you think wow now people can speak again and they can walk again with all these devices but when you tell us now what can happen with it and what what can go wrong this is really um, yeah this makes you sleep a little bit worse <laughs> I think um, and I am very happy that we can talk about this now. There is a lot of dilemma that you that you mentioned several times, and I really can see the dilemma in, in all these points that you raised. Uh, one struck me because I, as as representing a funding organizations and a ministry, we are always uh, attacked for our bureaucracy. <laughs> And we all hate GPDR, or at least the people who have to do research and whom we ask to, to be compliant with GPDR hate us. And we, we get all this criticism. How do we how do we manage this dilemma to be uh, compliant with the GPDR on one side and and lower bureaucracy on the other uh, side? Because it does increase bureaucracy. If you have to fill out forms, you know, before whatever you do, before you uh, put together a list of names you need to to fill out forms, 10 page, pages or something like this. How can we how can we find a solution that serves research on the one hand? and uh, the bureaucrats, the bureaucratic agencies on the other hand, because they have to follow this, of course. Well, uh, I, I should say that uh, with, uh, with every uh, of this uh, process to try to protect the people and the right of the people, you can make it uh, functional or you can make it bureaucratic. Uh, the, the, the meaning of bureaucracy is that it's just, uh, it used to be paper, now it's a numeri, num, uh, digital bureaucracy, but it's exactly the same. It's uh, filling files just to have files and uh, having plenty of uh, documents that are useless. So we absolutely need to dig and to discuss together what are the functional documents, what are the documents that are going to help protecting the people and to foster the science because all and, and also to foster our economy in some case because uh, we absolutely need the, the concept of science to be developed as tools that will help our uh, people with some kind of disability uh, to help uh, children uh, with some uh, uh, kind of, of learning difficulties and things like that. 
So uh, we have to, to comply with new processes that are going to, to help us to make a better science at the end of the day. Uh, this is something uh, that we are developing in, in many ways. Uh, for example, uh, in the framework of a uh, European program named Hybrida, uh, we have prepared some documents to have uh, a science more, much more truthful between scientists to increase the reproducibility, between scientists and evaluators, between scientists and ethical committees. Uh, research ethical committees. Here again, these are files to complete with a, a, an internet system, with a website that are not going to be implemented in bio, European biobanks like IBISC. When we tested this on our uh, organoid researcher community, they were very happy to uh, complete these files. Why? First, because these files corresponded to the items that they think important to make a reliable and reproductive science. Two, because like that, they are going to be much more trustful with colleagues. Three, because they know that it will be much more easy uh, when they go to some evaluation process or granting process uh, to come with this metadata and answer directly to the process with the metadata, not changing with the new format each time. So we need to fight bureaucracy and to improve functionality. Your microphone is switched off, Marlies. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you for, for this. We will do our best. That's what I said. <laughs> we have a question from the audience. Henk Lindemann is asking a very important question. In this moment, or currently, neuroethics seems to be a topic mainly discussed in scientific groups. What are the plans to involve the broad public in the debate of neuroethics, other than this lay lecture? So, um we we have uh, we have plans uh, at uh, various levels uh, first uh, at the levels of the scientific uh, uh, societies uh, we now try to develop some uh, lectures and public lectures some discussions with the lay public uh, this is already done uh, in many countries now with the brain awareness week uh, third week of March, and you know that the various neuroscience society, and this is the case for the, for the French, this is the case for the German neuroscience society, and many of us, uh, we go outside of our lab, we go uh, to meet the public and to have uh, discussions in libraries, uh, in uh, uh, supermarkets, in uh, places. Second, uh, at the level of FENS, our European organization, now there is a brain debate organized. And uh, uh, I will have the pleasure to share the next uh, brain debate uh, in Vienna, uh, 2024, June 2024. This brain debate will be on AI and the brain. And you see that we will discuss uh, these kind of ethical questions, and the lay public is welcome. The third level, uh, and I stay at the European level, is the European Brain Council. And the European Brain Council is not only neuroscientists. The European Brain Council is also patients' organizations, it's also uh, private companies. And the European Brain Council try to develop uh, public discussions on our brain and the health of our brain and how to develop the health of our brain. And I know that Marlies, your initiative as a CACH Health Brain, Brain Health, uh, will uh, try to foster this uh, aspect. So now we have our possibilities uh, to discuss uh, and to go openly and I didn't discuss uh, uh, forum that are organized by the national 
Council, for example, the Spanish uh, National Ethic Council just organized last week, uh, no, the, yesterday, it was yesterday because it was a 28th uh, public debate from the Senate uh, in Madrid around these questions of uh, uh, neural rights. So we have various levels and we need more people involved. We need more people involved and we need to, to as many goodwill as possible. Thank you, uh, Hervé. We have time for uh, perhaps a, a last question. Uh, in your uh, uh, document about uh, neurotechnology, it's, uh, you, you protect uh, or you suggest to, to protect the people without uh, uh, blocking uh, research and uh, without blocking the, the private company. It's, uh, uh, I think it's very nice, but uh, I think that we are facing a, a, a fundamental major issue, which is the access to the neurotechnology. Because uh, already in the uh, uh, industrial countries, not everybody can access uh, this new technology, especially for uh, 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 correcting uh, brain function. But if we think about uh, lower uh, income countries, it's uh, e even worse. So wh what is this uh, document saying uh, about the access? And uh, do you see a way to uh, <clears throat> having uh, a, a better access for uh, everybody uh, around the world? Because if we don't take this into account, some people will benefit, some will not benefit from these technologies and uh, it, uh, it, it it can re it's a, a real problem i think yes it's a it's a, a, a hit, hot problem for scientists like uh, like us because it's from our labs that these uh, innovations are raising um so um Complex questions, once again, sorry for very uh, naive uh, answers. Uh, access is a, a general question for any emerging technology. Uh, this is, uh, for example, the main question today about the new gene therapies that are obtained with genome editing. Uh, wonderful hope for rare disease, for cancer, but several hundred thousand euros per treatment. This is also the case for deep brain stimulation. Today, deep brain stimulation, if you take the device and include the care, it could be between 500,000 and 1 million per patient. So clearly, this question of access and this blockade by the price, uh, it's something we faced. Uh, we faced uh, very recently with COVID. Just remember that uh, even if vaccines were very uh, low in price, 50 euros or less, uh, access was limited because of the production and then limited by the number of infrastructures. So what we have to focus on also is that innovation is never a uh, single shot, it's never a magic bullet. Innovation is a whole process that you need to tackle and you need to consider as a various level. You need elites in all the countries. So you need more education, you need more training to research, to allow the various infrastructure to develop anywhere in the world. You need to have process to produce the device and to regulate the device. You need also innovation in the social practice. This was also the case for COVID vaccine. This will be also the case for new gene therapies with genome editing. And this will be the case for new neurotechnology. And you need once again education, education to how to use and in the best way this kind of device. So it's a kind of dialectic between the availability of the technology the distributive justice 
and the feedback uh, of uh, use to foster again research and development. So um, this is a, a very interesting democratic deliberation. What we want to do with this technology, what kind of priority uh, we do, what kind of reward for the private company. Uh, most likely in some case, the reward is too high or the expectation is too high, uh, too much money for a too small number of individuals, maybe some more distributed justice, not only um, uh, because of access. Uh, we have to tackle these elements. And the great thing of ethics is that it's a holistic view. It's a systemic view. And ethics is a very good compass to try to run uh, toward more uh, open societies, uh, societies that are respecting each of their individuals that are considering that whatever the color of your skin, whatever your religious belief, whatever your age, you deserve the same consideration because you are human. And this is the ethics as compass. Thank you very much, uh, Hervé. I'm afraid we have to, uh, 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 in fact, uh, close this uh, webinar. It's a uh, very, very uh, uh, important topic. We have seen that the lay audience uh, should be engaged in uh, neuroethics and uh, it should be discussed with the whole population of uh, our countries. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Hervé, for uh, sharing all this thought with us during this uh, ERANET Neuron uh, lay audience lecture. It was a pleasure to listen to your presentation. And by this, I'm closing this session. Bye-bye.